Split. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's start uh, this second afternoon uh, session uh, of the conference. Uh, we hope that uh, you are enjoying what you have seen so far. You had a good uh, lunch today. Uh, I will remind it again uh, af at the end of the uh, after this presentation. But uh, the General Assembly of the IAH will be here at 5 p.m. Don't forget to to be here uh, for the businesses of the association. And now is the time, the time for uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Helen Fias, will be the, of Fallas, uh, will be the next uh, speaker. Uh, she is a chief geologist of Scotland uh, with the British Geological Survey, but uh, more importantly, she is uh, the uh, leader of the IAH uh, Urban Groundwater uh, Network, and that's uh, what she's going to be talking about. So please, let's uh, welcome uh, Helen Fallas. Uh, delighted to be here um, and to highlight a little bit about the theme of urban groundwater and the urban uh, network in IEH. Um, we're having a meeting, network meeting tonight. Everyone's welcome. It's not just network members, so please drop along. So rather than talk about a specific piece of uh, research, scientific research in urban groundwater, I'm going to take a slightly different perspective and talk about how do we as the groundwater community ensure that our research and understanding of groundwater is able to inform city planning policy for the future. Because these really will be the key spatial strategies that deliver our future places. And building on Alan's talk from this morning, rather than being a secret society, how do we break free from that and really raise the awareness of groundwater within city planning? So I'm going to talk through a few examples of work which I've been leading in Scotland under a Knowledge Exchange Fellowship and then more recently under my role as Chief Geologist for Scotland in BGS and also some other examples of work um, from around Europe. So I think it's an important time for us to think about this because we live in a world where more and more information is available and there's increasing emphasis on terms such as data-driven innovation and digital transformation and there's also an increasing focus on investing in these tools as a means of strengthening city planning policy and their approaches. But how do we as a community ensure that these tools develop the right understanding and awareness of groundwater? Work by uh, Harvard University has estimated that 70% of the 1.3 trillion dollars spent on digital transformation actually fails to achieve its goals simply because there wasn't enough understanding of the processes, procedures and knowledge actually needed to be delivered. So how do we avoid a white noise of information of groundwater for city planning? So a little bit of context. Cities are increasingly important to how our environments and societies function. They cover only 3% of our land surface, but by 2050, the urban population will be equivalent to what our total world population was just 15 years ago. And making cities work and integrating groundwater roles into them through planning will be an important way in which we attain the sustainable development goals, how we achieve national targets of climate change, health, and well-being. And in the UK today, we still see life expectancy change in males by 14 years within just two inner city tube station stops. And that's alongside increased deprivation and proximity to lower environmental quality. Now, as we all know, groundwater has many roles to play in our future cities. Within Africa, where the urban population growth rate outstrips the ability for piped infrastructure provision to keep pace, groundwater forms a vital locally accessible source of drinking water, which millions uh, rely on. 
but there's a lack of integrated planning and also improved sanitation. So there's often a degradation of groundwater quality and it becomes a pathway of contamination. In high GDP cities, groundwater can also be a very important source of drinking water, but these cities are also looking to use groundwater in new multiple ways to meet heating and cooling demands and to implement new integrated surface water, groundwater management approaches to improve the resilience to flood risk and help alleviate surface water management pressures. So there's a need for strategic connected approaches and to integrate and harness groundwater within our future cities. City development plans and regional planning policies will be the key spatial strategies which will deliver our future cities and they form a key intervention point for our groundwater knowledge and research. And there's a growing trend and an emergence within some governments, not just in Scotland but elsewhere in Europe, that there is a need to fundamentally rethink evidence processes in order to strengthen the capacity of planning policy to deliver these approaches and for planning policy to be able to achieve targets of climate change and so forth. So how are we doing at the minute? What's the current picture of the use of groundwater and other environmental information in these city development plans? So this shows the findings of national engagement across Scotland with all 32 of the planning policy teams. And what becomes apparent is that at the critical early strategic stages of city planning approaches, there is very limited awareness of groundwater information or other environmental information for that fact. But these are the stages of the planning process where those critical decisions are made about integrated above and below ground infrastructure, where there might be identification of where sustainable urban drainage schemes might be a viable option to alleviate downstream capacity issues in, uh, in, in, in drainage infrastructure, or where decisions around where geothermal opportunities might be realised. In comparison, when you look down at the very end of the planning process, at the far right, that's where you have site scale design and planning decisions. And there, there is relatively good awareness and use of information relating to the groundwater and environment. Drilling down into more detail, what we find is that planning policy teams use an array of information relating to infrastructure, socioeconomics, conservation, and open space. But when you get down to environmental pieces of information, the use is much more limited and disparate. And actually, even if they're using a piece of information, what we find is it's often not the most pertinent piece of information to the question they're asking. And under any one of those environmental themes, up to half of the planning policy teams aren't using any information. And this picture exists despite significant investment and efforts over the last 15 years in Scotland to improve the dissemination and delivery of environmental information, including groundwater. So there have been shared web services and delivery platforms combining multi-agency information to make it available. But two thirds of planning policy teams don't interact with this platform at all. And it's not just Scotland. Similar findings have been found from elsewhere across Europe by different pieces of work, which I'm, I'm then going to spend the rest of the presentation coming on to. And what these highlight is that it's not just a lack of awareness of what information is out there, but much more fundamental disconnects between specialists working within planning policy, which leads to this current picture. So over the last 10 years, there's been a range of initiatives across Europe to try to develop this understanding of what do we need to do as a community to in in increase the use of subsurface knowledge within city planning. And one of the widest of, this, of these has been a five-year EU cost action called Suburban, and, and several of you in the audience were involved in this. This involved 31 countries, 26 cities, 
and it brought together primarily geological surveys, city municipalities and universities within each of these countries. And it was aimed at providing cities with knowledge of subsurface resources, opportunities and constraints. And it was very successful at developing a shared understanding of the commonality of issues, opportunities, challenges with integrating groundwater into city planning. And the action published a series of city reports and thematic reports which are available uh, from the Cost Actions website which is available for everyone to look at. The knowledge exchange work was also very successful at developing a network of interested specialists from a range of different disciplines across Europe with city partners. And this network has endured. And the learning and key themes of the work are now being extended and taken on by a new expert urban working group under the Euro Geosurveys initiative and more focused cost actions. But given the breadth of this knowledge exchange and mechanics of the cost action, the knowledge exchange between the specialists wasn't immersive enough or in-depth enough for us to really unpick city planning policy processes, to really identify what are the key intervention points for groundwater information and actually what information about groundwater is really required and what evidence processes are needed to bring it together. So since the cost action, there has been three independent pieces of much more in-depth knowledge exchange work done um, over the last two to three years. One's been focused on Oslo, another in Glasgow, and another in Gothenburg. And these have all taken the approach of embedding a geologist or a hydrogeologist within a city municipality planning policy team for a period of several years. And this enabled quite an immersive, in-depth learning process. So for a hydrogeologist to actually really understand the nuts and bolts of mechanics of how a city plan is put together. And for the planning practitioners to develop more of an understanding at a catchment scale of how groundwater works and what roles and interactions it could have. And these have all led to fairly significant change in approaches. Long-term knowledge exchange roles have been continued. There are new organisational interactions now happening and political interest and engagement has been raised with, of the subsurface in planning and groundwater. So what I'd like to do for the rest of this presentation is really to highlight some of the key lessons and findings and approaches which were taken by these pieces of work. I think one of the overriding findings and most important findings from all three was that in order for us to integrate our groundwater knowledge and understanding into city planning policies and city plans, it really requires us to communicate our understanding as an integral part of these process, rather than disseminating information from our own websites, our own delivery platforms or perspectives. Developing tools of bespoke information, be it groundwater or um, ecology, actually those tools become quite hard for planning practitioners to disaggregate and assimilate with all the other city data which they have to bring together to develop a city plan. One of the other overriding themes and findings has been the need for time, significant time, to develop the sufficient understanding between an array of specialists within planning policy. Because strategic planning policy at city scale is taking our knowledge into a wholly new sector. It's quite different from working with regulators of water supply who are still quite a technical audience. So we need significant time and this is needed to build trust and creativity of thought as well, and for iteration to happen. Our knowledge exchange really needs to be focused on procedure and process, rather than specific project outputs or, or, or focus time. And we need time to undertake a large amount of exploratory work. 
We need to test what works. We might find that some of the groundwater knowledge that's needed doesn't exist, so then we need time to be able to develop that as well. So just to highlight some of the exploration which we've been doing under these knowledge exchange case studies. In Glasgow, we wanted to test if by what's called front-loading knowledge to the city plan, so having an increased use of groundwater and environmental information in the city plan, does that actually strengthen the capacity of the city municipality to deliver those new integrated approaches to harness geothermal energy, to develop better surface water, groundwater management? And one of the key perceived um, barriers or difficulties in Glasgow is delivering or unlocking these brownfield land areas um, uh, and delivering uh, new infrastructure on it, be it housing or suds or, or whatever. So this map shows the uh, spatial extent of the city plan. The green is the green belt. So you can see Glasgow doesn't have much green belt. It's predominantly brownfield areas. And the red sites are the housing land supply sites, which, is, which the city plan needs to unlock. And what we did was we, we brought together a suite of environmental information, which we thought was relevant, working with the city council, BGS, regulators and other statutory environmental bodies and developed a spatial aggregated analysis. But what I'd, I'd really like to highlight here is that even with myself embedded in the city municipality for three days a week, it still took a year of discussions to really distill down what were the key pieces of information required that were pertinent to the questions. And it's not rocket science, this. it's not cutting edge science, but it does actually take quite a lot of expert judgment across an array of specialists to really ensure that appropriate thresholds of information, appropriate classification or categorization of information is done, to ensure that an appropriate scale of analysis is applied based on the resolution of understanding that we have about different processes, and to ensure that there was an, an accessible and appropriate presentation of those results. Oslo um, have been undertaking a, a similar exploratory case study work. Now, in Glasgow, we had the need to unlock development. In Oslo, they needed to strengthen the capacity of planning to constrain development. In Oslo, um, there's been a, a, a trend or a move for new buildings, such as the uh, beautiful Opera House in, in white in the top there, to be, take on quite an elaborate building design. And this has required much bigger and more complex piling foundations. And these have disturbed the groundwater dynamic within the city and has led to quite significant rates of subsidence within the city centre, so that the train station is currently subsiding quite significantly. So they undertook a very similar exercise to what we did in Glasgow. And they, they found very similar findings. This aggregated spatial understanding was required. But what I'd like to highlight is that it, even though Norway is a country known for its decades of use of subsurface and subsurface infrastructure, it still took more than two years for them to identify with a geologist embedded in the city planning team what were the pertinent pieces of geological and groundwater information to this approach? So time. Secondly, one of the second key themes that all three of these pieces of work have highlighted is that there is a need for new professional collaboration in planning. And they, we actually require new frameworks of institutional interaction to realize these. This might be done by secondments, in China, they've taken the approach of embedding urban planning bureaus within geological surveys. In Scotland, we've taken the approach of developing um, a new working group of key organisations. This was set up by the chief planner in Scottish Government to review environmental evidence processes in planning policy. And this group includes the national government, city municipality planning policy teams, it includes regulators, and for the first time, it includes the geological survey and expertise of geology and groundwater. And the group is now working 
to look at what new evidence processes could be part of new legislation being brought into planning in Scotland. And this is quite a significant opportunity for us to really raise the profile and awareness and use of groundwater information. The group has been recognised to have been quite a significant culture change in collaboration. It's brought together an array of technical specialists with planning practitioners, and it's been of real benefit. Thirdly, all three identified the need for long-term knowledge exchange roles to really help translate this understanding between specialists and illiteracy across specialists. And I think this is really critical. There's a need to understand the scalability of different types of knowledge and understanding of groundwater to different scales of question and analyses. And it's absolutely vital that planning policy teams have some appreciation of that scalability of knowledge in order for them to be able to harness the information available on the World Wide Web in an appropriate way. Oslo have just recently taken the move of appointing a municipal, municipality planning geologist as a means of keeping this long-term role going. And fourthly and finally, these studies have also found that 3D visualisation and dissemination of knowledge doesn't necessarily actually mean it make it all that more accessible to planning practitioners. It looks visually appealing and enticing and they say, yeah, that looks great, we want a 3D city model. But actually, when they come to use it and interrogate it, it's very hard for them to use. And I've had questions like, what's this showing? Is that what it should look like? So whilst at a site scale, construction industry have been very successful in using 3D visualisation of information and data under the BIM agenda, that doesn't necessarily translate to a city scale or for planning practitioners. And so some concluding thoughts to bring this all together from the work. I think from the learning that we've developed from these three case studies, I think we need a new model of professional collaboration and new frameworks for institutional interactions in order for us to really see an integration of different types of environmental knowledge into new city planning processes. But who funds this significant and long-term investment in knowledge exchange? Is it national governments, city municipalities, research councils or our own organisations? And it's not clear, it's, a, it's an evolving space, but there are new opportunities. The Scottish Government has just legislated this year a new planning act. And this has enacted quite significant changes to transform evidence processes in planning policy. And it's actually enacted the need for wider professional collaboration in planning in order to do this. So there are emerging opportunities for us as a community to grasp. I think transforming knowledge in city planning processes requires primarily not an investment in digital, techno uh, digital technology and capacity in technology, but first and foremost, an investment in collaboration and knowledge exchange. Because without this, we end up in the scenario of 70% of that $1.3 trillion leading to nowhere. And I think traditionally, we as a research community have occupied the space on the left and the planning practitioner world has occupied the space on the right. And really, we need to come together in the middle to really understand what are the key questions being asked by city plans and from there, what are the pieces of knowledge needed? Cities are hugely important for our future as is developing a collegiate understanding of the different roles that groundwater can play in them. New evidence processes from some of the exploratory work done so far can have significant value, but they require time and a large amount of professional collaboration and interdisciplinary work. But we need to develop that because otherwise we as a community won't be able to develop the right information at the right time or in the right form. Thanks very much.